Welcome to the Retzel Health Law Hotspot. Health Law Hotspot is a podcast for physicians and health professionals that covers the legal issues and trends that affect the healthcare industry. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Health Law Hotspot. I'm Erica Adler, shareholder and health law practice leader at Retzel and Andrus. And today I'm joined by Patrick Flaherty, AA. And today we're going to talk about a really fascinating topic. This has to do with the anesthesia shortage, both anesthesiologists as well as anesthesia providers, and what we can expect to see going forward, as well as the impact it's had on patients, uh, as well as uh, various other healthcare specialties as well. So let me introduce Patrick to you so you know who we're talking with. Patrick has been practicing anesthesia for over 14 years with leadership experience on a national level. He recognized a lack in the education for professional development of anesthesia clinicians. And to address those gaps, he founded bagmass.com in 2019, which is now the go-to anesthesia career site. Uh, it offers career advice articles, scholarships, and the latest job offers from across the country. So thank you for joining us today. Well, I appreciate the invite. I've been looking forward to this. Well, it's great to have you here, and I think this is a great topic, and I'm really excited. Since you are kind of on, you know, uh, the, the front edge of anesthesiologists and other types of providers in terms of the jobs that are available, in terms of who's looking, uh, I think this is going to be really insightful. So I guess what I want to hear from you really is, how is the anesthesia field doing right now? Are you seeing a lot of people looking for jobs? Are you seeing more jobs posted than applicants? What are you seeing in general? Well, I, I, that's a great question. And if you have all day and tomorrow, I think we could really get through this topic. But to keep it short, um, let's take it back to before COVID. Um, I wrote an article at that point in time calling that the golden era of anesthesia for job seekers. Um, we were starting to see all sorts of different types of sign-on bonuses, tuition reimbursement, Companies were really sort of looking at different ways to attract talent because there was a provider shortage to begin off with. Um, we're not graduating, graduating enough, you know, residents, CRNAs, and AAs to currently fill all the needs that are out there. And that's just due to a lot of growth that's occurring within the healthcare industry. Um, more surgery centers are opening up. Uh, hospitals are expanding their coverage of different sites just outside of the OR. Before, we were very specific to the OR. But now you're seeing us go into other places in the hospital. We're in IR. We're in endo. Um, we're doing TEs, these other locations that just don't encompass what you would think of what regular hospital ORs are. So there we were going into COVID, everything's looking you know, great as a job seeker. And then COVID hits and everything just really changed. I'm sure a lot of you remember this hospital stopped doing surgeries. And this had a, a ripple effect. First, it started with the locums providers. I don't know if you're sure, uh, familiar with the locums provider, but there are somebody who does like a short-term contract just to help out filling gaps in different areas. Right. So you had this whole industry of locums that just dried up. And there was no jobs for them. Next, what occurred was some of these hospitals shut down. They either furloughed their providers. Some places actually fired them. There's a, a place in Ohio, uh, sorry, Idaho, where they fired 53 CRNAs from a job. Boom, gone, out of the, out of the workforce. Then there was this reduced work hours everywhere. So we get through COVID and we're, we're working through this in I guess about back in November last year, I started having companies reach out to me and say, hey, we're gonna start ramping up hiring again. You know, we're opening up surgeries. Um, we're getting back to the point where we're starting to think about doing elective surgeries. You know, Let's start getting this moving. Then the, then when there came, um, we had another spike of COVID, things changed. And this is where this past year, right around February, March, things really start to get crazy in the anesthesia job market. If you're a job seeker, it got amazing. There was all these new opportunities opening up and the um, benefits and the pay was going up. But I don't want to jump ahead too far, but let's just sort of talk about some of the things that led to this. Um, one was retirement. We had a lot of people retire early. People who probably worked another two or three years saying, you know what, I'm done. Um, what we've been through recently, I don't know how long this is going to continue to last. I'm just going to step away right now. I can, I can take a step back and retire early. So now you have all this people that are leaving the workforce early. Um, the next thing that happened was a lot of these people are not a lot, but there was, you know, people had spouses who were able to work online now so they could take their job anywhere before where like, we have to go to Miami because this is where my job is. And the spouse is now able to go anywhere. So you have these people relocating just based on where their spouse can now, you know, just take a different job someplace. The third thing that happened, which was a big one um, that came from COVID was a lot of these groups lost a ton of money. 
they weren't getting paid. And if you're not getting paid, you can't keep the, your, your services up. Um, a lot of hospitals are already paying anesthesia companies stipends. Um, a lot of anesthesia groups can't make enough money just off of what they're getting paid from the insurance company. So the hospital provides them the stipends. So we've seen a lot of anesthesia contracts lost over this past year. And what this has occurred is, just give you say um, a local group that's been there for 30 years. I think there's one happened, this happened in Chicago recently, actually. They lost their contract, a uh, national company came on in. And when the national company came in, all those original workers say, you know what, we're not gonna work for you. We're gonna go find a job someplace else. So now you have this hospital that has 30 openings all of a sudden. So we're seeing this all across the country. Some places are being hit a little bit harder than others, but this has had a large detriment to just trying to find people to work. Um, the next part I would say is just the reevaluation of life. You know, we've got went through COVID. A lot of people are burned out from taking care of COVID patients. Um, they're thinking, you know, do I need to be in this location? Do I need to be in Washington, D.C. to provide anesthesia or can I go somewhere else? So you're starting to see them move. I, I know in the news we're seeing right now, we're seeing the title, The Great Resignation, a lot. I like to call it The Great Reshuffle. People are just moving to different places. All right. They're not necessarily quitting jobs. They're finding jobs other places, different parts of the world. Um, so location was a big deal. Um, I think the other thing that happened with this reevaluation is as an anesthesia provider, when you're at a facility for multiple years, you get very comfortable. Um, and that goes a long ways in, as providing really good anesthesia care. You understand the team that you're, you're working with, the facilities, the supplies that you have. And it makes it very difficult to leave a job. I was at my first job for about 10 years. And the only reason I left was because the hospital closed. I mean, I just felt comfortable there. I knew what I could expect every single day. And I liked working with everybody. And this has allowed people to rethink, you know, maybe I can actually take that step to do something else. Um, I know in DC here, one of the hospitals recently, um, they lost about eight CRNAs and AAs all within a four month time period. And these are people that have been at the same facility for a long time. It's a, it's a great place to work and people didn't never, never really left, but COVID sort of gave them that, you know, that push out the door, like, what should I see out there? Um, so this has all led to some other things. This is, goes back to the compensation. You have all these people moving around, leaving. Companies are finally realizing, you know, we need to have compensation packages that keep our providers here or attract new providers because trying to hire somebody is always a difficult process. If somebody leaves, the bringing the next hire is going to take anywhere from three to 10 months based on credentialing, licensing, and stuff like that. So what we're seeing right now is sort of an arms race within the anesthesia community as far as companies are increasing their pay. They see hospital X's has gone up on their benefits they're gonna sort of come back and try to match it or go up the same. So this is also causing people to move because now all of a sudden the hospital that's you know, 15 minutes down the road is offering an extra $15,000, maybe a $40,000 sign on bonus, better benefits, maybe better hours too. Um, so they're looking to make that jump. And then this is the big one that's really hit the anesthesia community hard is the locums industry. You know, we're talking about compensation that's normally for the W2 uh, people, um, but the locum industry has exploded. Um, Beginning this year, if you were working as a CRNA, an hourly rate was about $125 an hour. They're getting anywhere from $175 up to $200 an hour now. So why would you take a regular W-2 job if you have the ability to move around and get paid a ton of money? And they're hopping from site to site. And some of them are setting their own rates because they know hospitals are so desperate now to just to get providers. Um, so this is causing people to leave their, their full-time jobs because they see their, their buddy is doing this. Like, I'm going to hop on the gravy train while it's happening. Same thing's occurring with the anesthesiologists. Not to the same scale that it's occurring with the CRNAs, but anesthesiologists have seen a big bump in their locums rates also. So if, you're, if you don't have a family, you're able to travel, they're taking advantage of this situation. So it's sort of creating this continuous spiral of, you know, job openings. Um, there's really nothing yet that's sort of reset the market to say, hey, we have to leave the locums market and come back to um, working as a full-time employee. Right. Do you, do you think that the locums market is so hot because people are shuffling and trying to fill positions and this is something that will, you know, settle down once people are kind of in their new, more committed job positions? I mean, that could be one of it. I was at the ASA recently talking to a bunch of different leaders about, you know, what's going to slow down the locums industry. And I, I went back to, I mean, this is a far-fetched theory, but when we had the, uh, the Great Recession in 2009, I mean, that's something that's shrunk the locums industry to um, where people want us to have a full-time job. They want stability. Um, I mean, we can start talking about the U.S. markets. I'm not in economics, but 
everybody keeps talking about, you know, how the market's so hot right now, there's going to be some type of holdback. So that could potentially be one of them. But you're correct. Um, it's because people are shuffling around so much that these hospitals need to fill in these little gaps in between. Uh, I know of another hospital just talked to uh, in, in the Maryland area, area. They're losing four anesthesiologists over the next four months. To, all of a sudden, they just all sort of put in their resignations out at the same time. This creates a lot of pressure on that group now to bring in people quickly. And the only way to do that is through locums or trying to work PRN people. People will just sort of do part-time stuff, um, not necessarily locums. So yes, that is, I think you bring, that's a great point that you bring up. It is this reshuffling that is going to continue to fuel this locums market until it sort of settles down. And I think really nobody has an answer. You know, is it going to take COVID really just completely burning out? For people to sort of feel a little more stable or is this something that's going to take you know a couple of years where you know people are just sort of readjusting to the new norm well and anesthesia is one of those and there's other specialties as well but i know here in the chicago market um you know the lack of anesthesia in particular there was one hospital uh you know that terminated a contract and they didn't really have another group ready to step in with physicians and that had very much a trickle effect so we had for example ob that couldn't service their patients uh, at the hospital where they traditionally uh, have privileges. They didn't necessarily have another hospital where they had privileges. We had surgeons working at that hospital who couldn't provide services to their patients. And so obviously both of those are, are patient care issues, but the trickle down effect is that it's affecting also the business of those other practices. You know, the surgeon doesn't get paid unless the surgeon works. Right. And the ob doctors are having to reshuffle and send their patients elsewhere to practices that are largely already saturated. Right. So we've got patient care and we've got lost business. So the inability to kind of provide the anesthesia services uh, to the community really affects, um, you know, the hospitals, the patient, the other providers who depend on anesthesiologists. So I really think anesthesia is such an important piece of, you know, a cog in that big wheel. Of, of healthcare services. Um, and I guess I'm curious um, as to whether you're seeing any kind of trend where we could see that kind of incident happen again, like such a shortage, or do you feel like now there's enough movement where they're get, if they can't get permanent, they'll get locums? Like, can we really, are we gonna be avoiding procedures and surgeries now just because there isn't enough or is it more just, you know, reallocating resources? I honestly think it's just we don't have enough providers coming out of training currently. Um, and that's the we're trying to catch up for all those people that retired or people that quit early or maybe even looked on to a different type of profession. Um, it's going to really take graduating more residents, you know, increasing the residency programs. I know the CRNAs and the AAs on their sides are starting to introduce more schools. Um, that's definitely going to have an effect. But that effect's not going to take place until three or five years down the line, you know, as the program started getting ramped up and graduating. Right. So I, that's, I just think it's really a provider shortage issue that's going to continue on. Um, it, it can continue on for a decade because you think about all these baby boomers who are going to be retiring the next, you know, five to 10 years also, yeah. just adding on to this effect. Um, there's going to have to be a, a giant push. I don't know where that comes from. I don't know if it comes from government subsidies or um, encouragement to increase the amount of people who are starting to go into this field. But I would be very curious to, uh, you know, also find out from the universities on their side, are they still seeing the same amount of applicants applying for these positions after they've seen what happened this past year? I mean, they're, they're That's reading all these stories, hearing right. all these stories about these, uh, not even just anesthesia providers, but all sorts of doctors and nurses being put in these, these right. tough situations of, you know, being in ICUs with people just dying, bodies stacking up on the side of the road in trucks. That's a big deterrent for a lot of people. And we don't really know how that's going to play yet in the medical community. Absolutely. And I guess, you know, one of the more concerning things would be, uh, you know, the competition. So if you can go somewhere and get paid really well, then you're not going to go to those places that can't pay as well. So, uh, you know, perhaps uh, lower, uh, you know, income areas, rural areas, mm -hmm. um, you know, less uh, financially, um, you know, less rich, so to speak, hospitals, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of procedures move to surgery centers, as you mentioned. Yes. So, but there are certain procedures that actually need to be done in a hospital. So, you know, if those life-saving uh, surgeries can't take place because everybody wants to work at a surgery center, which by the way, can be very lucrative and often can mm -hmm. well afford to pay the anesthesiologist and providers, you know, what they're looking for. So this is really kind of a struggle here with a shortage. And 
I think at the end of the day, it's going to be really interesting to see who suffers as a result of this if some, you know, expedited changes aren't considered. But you're right, it could be three to five years before we see this play out. And by then, um, you know, I, it's hard to know what's going to happen. Yeah, it, it just reminded me of another point I, I forgot to mention is um, talking about the providers that are coming out and just the ones that are currently working is they're really starting to look at a work-life balance. Um, no yeah. longer is the idea of I want to work 80 hours a week, make partner. There's a lot of people out there that want to work part-time, um, especially I've talked to a lot of um, female colleagues in their early 30s, um, mid, in their 30s, that they want to be able to spend a little more time at home. They're not necessarily looking for that job that's going to take call at night, not even just uh, females, but males also. They don't want to be working on the weekends. They want to start enjoying their life a little bit more. I think COVID brought that out. So companies are going to really have to start thinking about, you know, this is from a recruiting angle is how do they provide these opportunities for people to work part-time or maybe like 0.8 of a full-time position? You know, do they need to always be part of the call schedule? This once again goes back to what you're talking about, you know, the ripple effect is if we don't have enough providers there in the OR all the time, surgeries are going to get pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. Um, so this once again goes back to we need more providers entering the workforce to sort of accommodate what people want for a work-life balance. And a lot of them are were are able or not able, but um, they're up for taking a pay cut just to have that, just so quality I can sleep life. in my bed every quality right. life. Yeah, I mean, it quality makes life. That's what everybody's kind of looking for now, especially after COVID. And and you're right. I guess this is just such an important area because we're really not. Just, I mean, some there's elective surgeries, but there's elective surgeries that if you don't have, uh, become life threatening, right? And then there's the actual you know, urgent surgeries where there's accidents or, uh, you know, you, uh, you know, other type of medical situations where you can't wait. So when we start pushing things back, it's going to be, we're going to see like kind of, you know, we, you and I were talking personally about long COVID before, and this is actually going to be really interesting. This is almost another kind of long COVID effect uh, on the workforce um, and patient health. Uh, and population health as a result of, of what's happened here. So it's gonna be really interesting, um, maybe not in a positive way to kind of see what the outcome of this is. Um, you know, from a recruiting standpoint, and I know, you know, your site posts jobs. I mean, obviously it's going to be um, whoever posts the best location, the best hours, the best perks, et cetera, is going to get that candidate on the other side of things, you know, and that's where I come in. When I'm looking at these contracts for, my candidates or I'm writing the contracts for my group, it's going to be important for us from a lawyer and from a hiring perspective for practices to also, you know, be aware that, you know, the market is really tight right now. So we've got to maybe give in on things we otherwise would have fought over in a normal contract negotiation, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe offer things that, you know, we otherwise would not have offered because I can see a lot of private groups, uh, you know, really finding it hard um, no matter what they offer to kind of, they're competing for the same small pool of candidates now. Um, so there's a lot of different features of this shortage that are going to impact um, a lot of industries and other professionals as well. You're absolutely 100% correct. And it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out over the next few, few months to the few years. Right. Well, I guess then we're going to have to have you back in a couple of years to give us kind of the update on this. Um, I, I'm really curious. I don't know if everybody's aware. Uh, I, I think everybody who's a medical professional is likely aware of the shortage and how it's impacting people. But other listeners out there may not be aware uh, of really the impact um, that COVID has had on anesthesia providers and that the shortage of anesthesia providers has had on uh, patients and uh, the community at large. So I think this is a great topic. Um, all right. So any last thoughts you want to share on this topic? I think it's been great. No, I, th I think we covered a lot of stuff. Um, I just hope everybody out there, you know, stay safe during this. I know we're not quite through COVID quite yet, but, uh, you know, just stay strong, keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Great. Good advice. All right. Well, Patrick Flirty, thanks for joining us today. And for all of you out there, please feel free to check out our other podcasts at RA Law. Dot com. You can also Google the Health Law Hotspot and you'll find us there as well. We hope you'll join us next time. Thanks so much. The Retzel Health Law Hotspot is made available by the firm and its attorneys for educational purposes and to provide general information, not to provide specific legal advice. Use of the Retzel Health Law Hotspot does not create an attorney-client relationship between you and the firm or any of its attorneys. 
The Retzel Health Law Hotspot should not be used as a substitute for competent legal advice, and you should contact an attorney in your state about any legal needs or questions you may have.